Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is October 20th, 2017. Greetings from Ocean Park, Maine, where I connected by Skype this week with Myrna Valerio in northern Georgia. Her blog is named Fat Girl Running, and her new book, A Beautiful Work in Progress, encourages any of us, no matter what we weigh or what shape our bodies are in, to get active, exercise, and maybe even run an ultramarathon or two. Myrna's is a remarkable story, and I hope you will enjoy listening to her. You know, whether or not you should be out there running in your big body, because, you know, maybe you're going to hurt your knees or your back. You don't know. You don't know me. I don't know you. You do your run. I do my run. And then we'll all be happy. (laughs) Also on this week's show, we will check in with the gold rush sparked by Amazon's HQ project, applications for which closed yesterday, October 19th. And I'm going to share insights related to Amazon, Jeff Bezos, and a successful life that I gleaned at my Harvard College and Harvard Business School reunions, which were both on uh, at the same weekend last weekend in Cambridge. First up in news, more than 150 locations have said they submitted bids to become the site of Amazon's second headquarters, HQ2. An analysis by the New York Times picked Denver as the likely winner, but more recent coverage seems to favor Boston as a top prospect. San Antonio pulled out of the race, but the Seattle area submitted a 522-page bid to locate HQ2 in the same vicinity as HQ1, not an outcome that anybody considered likely. Depending on which factor you think means the most to Amazon, you can get different results in trying to predict the winner. If minimizing the time executives spend flying from Seattle to the new HQ turns out to be a top consideration, Denver, 5.2 hours door-to-door, would have an edge over Boston, 7.3 hours. Sacramento, California, would be only 4.1 hours. This analysis Uh, comes from Kevin Bowe, a corporate consultant quoted in a story by Matt Day in the Seattle Times. An economist for Moody's Analytics, Mark Zandi, lined up 29 sets of data matching Amazon's preferences, and he came up with Austin, Texas as the top contender because of its low tax rate and strong job growth. Boston came in at number nine in the analysis, but Denver didn't make the top 10. And in that ranking, he didn't include Seattle, even though it came in at number eight. That was a little confusing. After Austin, Moody's ranked Atlanta second, followed by Philadelphia, Rochester, New York, Pittsburgh, New York City, Miami, Portland, Oregon, Boston, and Salt Lake City. A top five list prepared by Marsha Layton Turner, writing at Forbes, comprised Atlanta, Austin, Toronto, Boston, and Pittsburgh. Uh, As you know, I am partial to Darlene's in my two hometowns, Boston and Denver, so I have paid particular attention to their bids. Boston submitted a 218-page proposal with two beautifully produced videos. Uh, Here are excerpts of coverage from NPR's local affiliate in Boston, WBUR. The city of Boston is basically banking on its tech talent and educational institutions to lure Amazon here. Uh, The bid also you know, boast a lot about all of the amenities and attractions in Boston. It talks about the history of Boston, the history of invention. But throughout the bid, it, the city is really touting the area's colleges and universities, as well as its strong labor force and booming tech sector. Uh, what's notably missing from the bid is any sort of tax incentives. The city wants to see what Amazon is willing to offer before uh, putting forth any sort of incentive package. It really thinks here that it's strength is education and talent, and it's hoping that that will get it through the first round of Amazon's bidding process. John Barrows, the Boston official who's heading up the effort to lure Amazon to Boston, uh, talks about the Suffolk Downs site in East Boston. It's the perfect site. I'd put it up against any site in the country. It has the capacity to build a 500,000 square feet building by 2019, which Amazon is looking for. It then also has the capacity to build up to 8 million square feet by 2027. It's four minutes from the airport. Whenever I hear mention of Suffolk Downs, I think back to August 19th, 1966, when my sister and I 
uh, along with my long-suffering parents, traveled all the way in from Wayland, Massachusetts, one of the western suburbs, to the wilds of East Boston to see the Beatles perform a concert on a flatbed trailer down on the racetrack at Suffolk Downs. Uh, there were 25,000 screaming fans. I don't think we could hear the music at all, but it was a moment that uh, I certainly remember. And I think for probably 40 years, either my sister and I had a little bag of confetti that was thrown at the Beatles at Suffolk Downs. Uh, it did seem a long way from Wayland, Mass., uh, but I, when I see the description of it, it does make sense as a site in Boston, especially the, just a few minutes to Logan Airport, which is pretty amazing, and also being on two Blue Line stops. Uh, that's part of the, the T system in Boston, the first subway system in the country. A little aging now. I would think something like Amazon might provide some funds to update the subway system. The excellent WBUR report goes on to emphasize the role that higher education institutions play in putting together the Boston bid. Over a dozen local colleges and universities wrote letters of support um, for Boston's bid. This includes MIT, Harvard, Northeastern, Boston College, Boston University, uh, as well as a number of other local schools. Um, they expressed overwhelming enthusiasm about Amazon possibly coming here, um, as well as a willingness to partner with Amazon. Um, so, for example, MIT says it's extremely excited about Amazon possibly coming here and notes in its letter that it would like to play a role if that happens. So would my alma mater, as it turns out. And I, I got some information about this at the Harvard Business School MBA reunion that I attended. That was my 40th reunion class of 1977. At one of the big sessions at the reunion, we heard about a site near the business school that might beat out Suffolk Downs, although Suffolk Downs clearly seems to be the one that's featured in Boston's bid. Uh, this site is part of Harvard's expansion to Alston and Brighton across the Charles River from Harvard Yard, where, which up until now has been been kind of the psychic center of the university. That's where the freshman dorms are, and it's a, just a classic area. There's this statue of John Harvard that everybody touches the shoe so that it's it's all worn down from thousands of people touching the shoe of John Harvard. Uh, if When this Alston Brighton campus gets built, the business school turns out to be kind of the center of things. And one official that we heard during the reunion said that Harvard envisions an enterprise research campus near the business school uh, adjacent to a state-of-the-art engineer Center now under construction as the new home for Harvard's School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Uh, this official, in his overview of the school's relentless progress and growth in the past 40 years, seemed very excited about the possibility of Amazon locating HQ2 in that research campus in, uh, right next to the business school. That location is one of several options to Suffolk Downs that is referenced in the, uh, the Boston's bid. I tried to schedule a follow-up interview to learn more about the pitch to Amazon, and I was politely turned down by this official for the understandable reason that he didn't want to say anything to a larger audience that could possibly jeopardize the landing of a very big fish for Harvard. Also, you know, for the area, but to, to have proximity to it for Harvard would, would obviously be great, and I'm sure MIT would love it to be right next door to them. Boston Mayor Marty Walsh has been an enthusiastic proponent of Boston, of course. But in this interview on another station, I thought he seemed to have a little trouble pronouncing the name of Amazon's CEO. Uh, I doubt Jeff would hold that against Boston, but still. You know, the bid obviously be going in tomorrow. Uh, we have it finalized. I just signed the letter today, uh, the final letter that we did uh, to, to Jeff Benzo, the, the CEO uh, of the company. I'll give the mayor credit for an original mispronunciation of Jeff Bezos's name. Uh, I've heard lots of people talk about Jeff Bezos. I've never heard him called Jeff Benzo, so that's a first. Denver's bid, which was covered in the local press there, emphasized quality of life, the weather, the outdoors life in the mountains. I think the transportation system in Denver is second to none, so that's also a pretty strong bid. So sometime next year, there will be a very big story when Amazon announces the location of HQ2. I go back and forth on this, and at this point, if Jeff asked my advice, I would probably recommend Boston because of the chance for Amazon to locate next to a major expansion of Harvard focused on engineering. Also, the Suffolk Downs site seems uh, remarkably well-suited to the scale of the project that Amazon is 
uh, looking at. Uh, this is just going to be an amazing uh, decision to wait for, and the amount of energy and creativity that has gone into bids from all over. There was a town somewhere that was going to rename itself Amazon, and odd presents have been sent to Jeff Bezos, and it, it was really unleashed, unleashed a lot of aspiration and hope. At the same time, there's been a bit of a backlash or pushback uh, emanating mainly from Seattle about, whoa, well, you know, be careful if you get what you wish for that. Uh, Having Amazon can cause a lot of problems. Certainly growth issues in Seattle uh, have been an issue for Amazon and it actually led to the search for a new location. But it's funny to read those accounts and then see the amount of effort and energy that's going in 150 different locations trying to get uh, this corporate headquarters. Uh, it seems unlikely that that many people are wrong in thinking this would be an extremely useful and helpful thing for a city to attract. Another item in news this week, uh, you probably received a surprising email from Amazon notifying you of yet another gift credit at Amazon.com as part of the long-ago Apple eBooks antitrust settlement. Mine was for $23.06. That would cost uh, the price of an ebook, uh, even from one of the big five publishers, even at their ridiculously inflated ebook prices. I received word from others of you who'd received uh, similar credits. Mark Roberts scored an impressive $4.96, and Sam Hendricks's credit was truly impressive, $165.82. For Garrett Riley, it was $67.14, and for Brett McNeil, it was $32.46. I haven't checked Darlene's account to see what hers is. I'm sure it might uh, top the list there because of the volume of books that, that she uh, buys from Amazon. You don't have to do anything to have these credits added to your account as a result of the settlements of the antitrust suit brought against Apple and the big publishers. I thought all of the payments to customers had been made, but the email from Amazon contained the following explanation. These settlements resulted in customer credits that were distributed in June 2016 for qualifying Kindle book purchases made between April 1st, 2010 and May 21st, 2012. These credits expired in June 2017. Customers who redeemed some or all of their credits from the June 2016 distribution are eligible to receive additional credits in October 2017 as mandated by the court. These credits are funded by Apple, so that's why these have shown up now. Uh, this credit will expire at 11.59 p.m. HST on April 20th, 2018. I didn't know what HST stands for. It turns out it's Hawaii Central Time, which seems like an odd zone to pick for that notification. In any event, thank you again, Apple. Uh, finally, in news, I want to share the answer to a question that one of my college classmates posed. That was on the other side of the river at the Class of 72 college reunion. Uh, it was a question posed to David Ignatius, a uh, prize-winning international columnist for the Washington Post. David was a star at the Harvard Crimson when I was a reporter for the university's daily newspaper, and he has been covering the Middle East and the CIA for more than 25 years. He is also a novelist whose new espionage thriller, The Quantum Spy, will be published by W.W. W. Norton on November 7th. He was on a panel discussion about the news business, and as the Q&A approached, I was planning to ask him how he would grade Jeff Bezos so far as the Washington Post owner. Someone beat me to it by asking a generic question of the panel. She wanted to know if wealthy tech moguls buying media properties is good news or bad news. Ignatius fielded the question with this answer. The, I could give a quick um, one-word answer is Bezos. Uh, so uh, it's nice to be owned by a man with $90 billion. Uh, I think the last estimate is I uh, worked 32 years for Washington Post. The idea that it would ever be owned uh, and run by somebody not from the Graham family, I couldn't have imagined. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the day that Don said he was going to have to sell the paper, I was shat. Uh, uh, falling off the edge of the world. Um, Don did something incredibly courageous, which was to realize he could not continue to afford the level, of the quality of journalism that the country and the world requires from the Washington Post. So he did this incredible thing of looking for and finding somebody 
would be a, a great steward for the paper. Mm. I, I don't want to talk about all the things that Amazon does because I don't know enough. But I will tell you that as an owner of our newspaper, Jeff Bezos has been absolutely fantastic. He doesn't get involved much. When he came to see us in the beginning, he said, I don't know what's going to work, but I'm going to lengthen the runway. I mean, I'll give you more time to figure out what might get left. And that's what we've done. We, you know, we brought engineers into every meeting with journalists so it would work better for users. He, he put, allowed us to begin hiring young journalists again so our newsroom was alive. So, you know, we're, I don't like being a, a, phil, a philanthropic cause, which is what we are. We're beginning to make money again. But I do know that the right person who sees this as a public trust, as Jeff obviously does, has done good things for my people. Uh, I've got a couple of tech tips for you. Uh, first, Tom Semple corrected me on my coverage of the all-new Oasis. I thought I had heard the Kindle people I spoke with in New York saying that there would be TTS, text-to-speech, uh, capability using the Bluetooth speaker uh, feature of it. Uh, he pointed a link to the manual, and it only shows voice view, which is the uh, accessibility aspect of it. So I think Tom's probably right in that there isn't TTS. And maybe sometime down the road that'll be coming. Tom also noted that the Audible feature is coming to the original Kindle Oasis and also to the Kindle 8th generation quote in coming months. Another tech tip is for the Kindle Oasis 8th generation. That's the current Kindle Oasis, not the all new one that's going to be available October 31st. The software update is now online so that you can get it manually if you want to plug your Kindle into the USB port of your computer and download it. I'll have a link to that in the show notes so that you can find it. It should also make its way to your Kindle wirelessly if you connect to Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, some night it'll just show up. The items that this in covers our general performance improvements and several new features. Bold control. Uh, you can now set the boldness level on all reading fonts for enhanced readability and eye comfort. This is what I talked about. I saw that on the new uh, Kindle Oasis that I saw in New York. The new bold option can be controlled from the display settings. That's the AA menu in books. There are more font sizes with this update. You can now choose from 14 different font sizes to suit your reading preference. I like the ability to have more choices. I, I think on my Fire, maybe in the 10 inch Fire, there's a gap. There's a place where one choice is too small and one choice is too big, and it, it's kind of irritating. So I think more choices between the different sizes is a good idea, and that's part of this update. And then there are redesigned search results. See chapter headers with in-book search results to help you find what you're looking for. I didn't see that demonstrated, so uh, I'll, I'll check that out. This is like a previous update, so if you do it manually, you'll have the file downloaded to your computer, then you'll transfer it to your Kindle at the top level of the menu, and then when you uh, plug in, uh, start up your Kindle, you'll go to settings, and then uh, device information settings again, and that you'll get to a place that says update your uh, Kindle, and then that's where you'll see the boy sitting on the tree, and there'll be a long bar graph, and when it's done, you will have the, the latest update. Time now for the interview. Myrna Valerio, known as the Myrnavator on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, is a Juilliard-trained singer, a diversity practitioner, Spanish teacher, and cross-country coach at a school in northern Georgia. Her blog, Fat Girl Running, is about running, not weight loss. This month, she released her first book, A Beautiful Work in Progress, published by Grand Harbor Press an imprint of Amazon Publishing. I connected with Myrna on Tuesday, October 17th, between Ocean Park and Georgia. I began by asking what sort of a reader she was when she was growing up in Brooklyn. You know, I wasn't the typical child reader. I read a lot of books that were intended for adults. <laughs> um, I Like when I was in fifth grade, I read the entire V.C. Andrews series, Flowers in the Attic, If There Be Thorns things like that, Seeds of Yesterday. <laughs> um, I, I remember very vividly being in my in the top bunk of my bed and, and snuggling under the covers and having my mom yell, go to bed. But I was, you know, still reading these books. Um, but before that, I, I really, really loved 
the weekly reader series, you know, as a second or third grader. Um, I read highlights all the time. And then after, actually during fifth grade also, while I was reading V.C. Andrews, I had also discovered Scott O'Dell. Scott O'Dell wrote The Island of the Blue Dolphins, and which... For some reason, I you know I don't even remember what it was about that book that number one made me read it more than once, and I am not a person that reads books more than once, unless I'm doing it for a class. Um, but there was something about the the pacing and the the, the character development. Of course, I'm not you know in fifth grade I wasn't thinking about character development, but um, and the, just the beauty of the characters and the beauty of the story that that really stayed with me and really resonated with me. That's one of the books that sticks out in my mind. And, and actually, when, when audiobooks became a thing, I immediately barred it from the library and listened to all 10 or 12 hours of it. It was just phenomenal to, to, to relive that part of my childhood in that way. So that was, that was one of the, the books that was really important to me. And also, as I was applying to college, I actually wrote an essay. One of my college essays was about um, a book that had sort of changed my perspective as, about something really important. And it was Amy Tan's The Kitchen God's Wife. And there was something, again, something about that book. And I think it was sort of the opening up of my own perception of what China was and what it symbolized and, and who, who its people were. It changed my perception and my perspective on, on history and all the things that are related to a country's history um, in a sociocultural manner. And that was a winning essay <laughs> yeah. because I got into the school that I wrote it for. <laughs> the, yeah, the Oberlin. That was Oberlin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, Island of the Blue Dolphins, the three, um, the V.C. Andrews series, and then the uh, Amy Tan book were, were three of the, 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 the books that really um, – were very important to me. I, I'm interested to hear that you loved listening to audiobooks because I, I listened to quite a bit of your book on the Audible version. I see that you recorded that yourself. <laughs> uh, it, it clocks in at uh, nine hours and 59 minutes long just to listen to it. How, <laughs> did it take quite a bit longer than that to record it, or what, what was that like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it took um, about three, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three and a half days to, um, to make that recording. It, it was really, really, um, an intense experience. you know, kind of like reading my own words and, and bringing those characters, even though I knew everybody, bringing them to life again, you know, sort of through the, through the lens, uh, and filter of my own experience. So, so that was, that was really, really incredible. And now it looked like it was recorded by, uh, not at the Audible Studios. Where did you go to do the recording? I went to the Brilliance oh, Audio Studios in mm -hmm. Grand Harbor, Michigan. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Huh. Did they have to give you training? As to, I mean, you're not a, like a voice actor, like to do a lot of these audible books. What, what are the main tricks they told you were important to do when you're recording your you own book? You know what? We jumped right in. <laughs> Um, I did have to, I did have to audition, um, prior to me actually getting the gig, oh. which I thought was really funny. Um, <laughs> I said, well, I have to audition for my own book, but I get it. I get it. Not everybody's a good reader. Um, but the, uh, the other thing is I do have a background in performance. Right. So, um, and you know, I went to school for uh, vocal performance actually. And so, uh, it was something that came very naturally to me, even though it took a while for me to kind of get in the zone and to be comfortable listening to my own voice. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was really cool though. And I was, I was super happy to be able to do that, to read my own book. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, what is the book about? Let's, let's set the stage for someone that hasn't heard about it. And, uh, it's a memoir and what are you trying yes. to do in this book? Well, first of all, it is a non-linear <laughs> memoir. <laughs> I want people to know that right off the back. It's more of a series of connected personal essays that tell you the story of how I became a runner, why I run, why I continue to run, even though I'm still fat. Um, and it's not, um, it is not a weight loss narrative. It is, um, I, you know, I'm calling it a body positive running memoir. What about the rest of us yeah. uh, who 
love running just because we love running and it has made our lives better and it, it has definitely made my life better from the time that I started in 1989 as a as a field hockey player in high school I used running to get better at the sport uh, I had never really been a runner um, and I noticed that there was a lot of running required <laughs> <laughs> to be able to um, to survive a game uh, to, or to survive practice. And so um, that's what I started to do. And I just, I grew to love it. It made me feel great. It made my days, um, it, it made me able to um, survive throughout the day of a very busy day of um, a boarding school student. I kind of went in the book, I wanted to spread that joy and enthusiasm, but give, also give you the backstory of who I am, how I came to be, um, and then and, uh, and how I continue to do the work of, of spreading the joy and love of, um, of running just to run <laughs> and not necessarily to lose weight or to, um, you know, with, with that whole um, narrative. Um, that was part of that's part of my story, especially um, when I had a health scare in 2008. That is definitely part of my story. I, re- I recommitted to running after thinking that I was having a heart attack. And, um, and I know that I knew that I needed to lose weight. So I did. Uh, but then it became something much more um, expansive than that. Um, it became just a way for me to, it became part of my lifestyle. And, uh, and you know, that was in 2000, 2008. What is this 2017? Um, I, you know, I haven't stopped since and, and it continues to make me feel good. And it continues to help me model or to role model someone who does fitness because it's a good thing for your body. Um, and so like, I wanted to get all of that <laughs> in the book. Um, I think I did. I think I did that. I, think I, I was able to achieve that um, along with some sort of showcasing the characters uh, and, and really, really important people in my life that um, were very important in terms of, you know, in my formative years, even as an adult, um, all of those people who have la- left lasting impressions on me. Well, and your, your story is dramatic because you, you grew up in Brooklyn and then through this program, an innovative program, you ended up going to a, a private girls boarding school. What was the name of that school? Masters? Sure. The name of the school is the Masters School. Mm-hmm. Uh, and back in the day, it used to be called Dobbs, the Masters School. But then they went through a bunch of like sort of marketing things. <laughs> and now they are the Masters School at Dobbs Ferry. Oh. Um, but yeah, it was a very small, all girls, very nurturing, wonderful, wonderful school um, that I had the fortune of attending. Yeah. And so, you know, I get there the first day and I'm immediately thrown into, okay, now you can try out for sports. So I try out for field hockey. And then a couple of days later, it's, hey, um, you can, you can audition for Glee Club. And so I auditioned for Glee Club and then ended up <laughs> starting my musical career there. Started taking voice lessons and piano lessons. And then I went to Juilliard on the weekends at the, uh, the Juilliard pre-college. And so like all these things opened up, the entire world opened up for me there. And so, you know, and I definitely attribute that place with where I am now and, and the things that I'm able to do. Yeah. It's wonderful. I noticed that it's co-ed at some point. I went to an all boys school in Belmont, mm-hmm. Mass. So that issue is interesting to me to, do you think that was a good move to the, for the school to go co-ed and a different experience than what you had? Well, you know, initially it, cause it went co-ed in 1996. Um, and so I still felt a, a very, very strong connection with the school and, and the, the ethos and the, uh, of, of the, the place um, that I knew. But, you know, the school was probably in financial trouble and it needed to do something drastic in order to stay open. And so I think once we learned that, once all, all the, um, the alums learned that this is what the school needed to do, I think we were a little bit more okay with it. And uh, it's still the same place. It's still the same very nurturing place. It, it has boys. And so there are some differences but because, you know, boys bring inherent differences to any, uh, any sort of arena. And, um, but I, you know, it, I think it's the same place. I still love it. I actually went back to teach there when it was co-ed. And so that was an interesting experience to be on the other side, but to also have boys in the mix. Um, but yeah, I still love it. And Hopefully one day my kid will go there. <laughs> oh, that's right. That, that means your son can now go there. Yes. So 
your book is published by Grand Harbor Press. That's an imprint of Amazon Publishing. That's kind of how I, I learned about it. And it's doing really well on Amazon. I mean, did various categories. At one point, it says you're ranked 825 among all of the paid Kindle books and the millions listed on uh, Amazon. So it's, it's off to a very nice start. Uh, but now I've heard from other authors who thought about publishing with Amazon that one of the things that concerned them was that some of the bookstores, indie stores, Barnes and Noble are resistant to displaying books published by Amazon just because there's a lot of history with Amazon. And I called uh, Acapella Press, which I think is an indie bookstore in Atlanta. They're, they weren't open yet. So mm -hmm. I checked their website and your book is not listed in their inventory of books. Have you uh, seen your book in any uh, bricks and mortar bookstores other than Amazon? And is that issue of whether or not it's going to be displayed there something that concerns you at all? I have not personally seen my book in a bookstore, but uh, some of my followers have seen uh, my book. Um, and I think in indie bookstores, there's one down in Athens, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget the name of the, the, the bookstore, but they, um, they said, yeah, I saw I picked your book up at su such and such bookstore in Athens. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. I'm not really, I'm not concerned <laughs> at all. Um, just from what I've seen, um, that Amazon is able to do just in terms of online marketing, I think, I, I still like to see books. I still go to bookstores and I still like to, to, to feel them and handle them and smell the paper. Yeah. <laughs> I know there are a lot of people like that, so I'm not, I'm not crazy. Um, but, um, but, I, but just, just from the sales that I've had so far since October 1st and also, um, with the, with my book being on the, one of the Kindle first choices, um, the, it's been really incredible. So I'm not, I'm not concerned at all. Again, I would love to see it in, in um, you know, <laughs> in real life <laughs> at a bookstore, but, but, um, you know, but if that's not the way it works these days, I'm, I'm totally fine with like having most of it be online. Yeah, that makes sense. I think some people get trapped in sort of the, I don't know, it's a fairy tale. I'm going to be an author and I'm going to walk in and I'm going to see my book in a store. And it's, it's sort of like the old story of becoming an author mm -hmm. when really what you're trying to do is sell books and, and find right. readers. And you're right. certainly off to a good start doing that. Yeah, I think, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, your running. I, this is all new to me. I, I've never been a, a runner. I, I've got sort of weak knees and I I'm envious of people that can run for hundred K and everything that you do is just like <laughs> reading a story about someone that's visited the moon to me. You run, you like to run on trails. You like to run outside, but give a sketch of the, the kind of running that you've done and that you continue to love to do. Yeah. Um, well I, I do both road running and trail running. I do have, uh, uh, particular love for being out on the trail though, because I just, you know, um, I have always loved to be outdoors. I've always loved the woods. Um, I know I'm from Brooklyn, <laughs> but, uh, you know, early on I, I had a lot of opportunities to be in nature and that's what hooked me. Like the, one of the very first experiences I had was uh, being sent to sleepaway camp and I loved it, even though it was terrifying those first couple of days, um, I, I, I grew to get used to hearing the birds and the, <laughs> and the crickets at night and, and, and being enveloped by total silence. Um, I love that. So every time I'm out on the trail, I can kind of recreate that feeling. Um, and so, so that's where I prefer to be, but I also, I do love road running. I love road marathons. I've, I've done Marine Corps marathon five times, uh, New York city marathon and a couple of other marathons. And I, I really, I love the distance. I love being out there for long periods of time, even though it's not always comfortable and I'm not always super happy in the moment. Uh, sometimes I'm in pain, but afterwards, ev after every single long run or, or marathon or ultra marathon, you know, I really feel like I've moved up another level in my own human potential. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what draws me to the sport. And, you know, it's, again, it's not always fun. It's not always painless, <laughs> but my body is stronger for it. My mind is stronger for it. And it's, you know, it's just, it running has been incredible to me. You know, when I think of running and it seems like a stereotype is a lot of people run in order to lose weight and mm -hmm. you write in the book and you've talked in some of the things I've seen online and videos that uh, when you show up at a race, most people don't look like you in terms of how much they weigh. It seems as if you gradually took on the mission of 
giving people encouragement to run, no mm-hmm. matter whether they, they had some kind of a, a stereotypical runner's body or not, that you were sort of waking up to the idea that just because of the life choices you'd made, you were really were becoming a symbol or an inspiration for people. How do you describe that part of your, your growing sense of uh, kind of what you were put here to do? Well, there was definitely a transition um, in, around, in about 2010, early 2011, I really just got hooked on doing half marathons and a friend of mine decided to ask me to do a marathon with her and I and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and in that, I also started my blog, Fat Girl Running, because at, at, you know, at this point, I I'd lost all the weight that I was going to lose. And, you know, my, my weight loss had plateaued, but I wasn't, I wasn't upset about it. And you went, cause when you had that health crisis, you were over 300 and then that what? Was, I was over 300 pounds. And at this point I was around two, I was just below 250. And, um, and that's where my body stays. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, that's where it likes to inhabit. <laughs> and so, um, I, uh, yeah, so I started the blog and, uh, cause I just wanted to share my experiences. Cause I, you know, I was getting comments from people, Hey, you know, are you volunteering? Are you a spectator? Are you, um, are you doing the 5k? No, actually I'm doing the 20 miler or the, whatever it is. Um, and, oh, oh, okay. You know, and then, um, and so like, I, I wanted to write about, people's reactions to seeing me um, at the start line, to seeing me out there, to seeing me finish. Because I, I, I felt like other people were probably either having these experiences or they were afraid of having these experiences so they wouldn't go out on the trail or, or to do a 5K or a 10K or whatever because they were afraid of what people would say to them. And so um, I, I felt like, not that it was my purpose, but I felt like I could I could help people to sort of get over that um, or to acknowledge that it's going to happen because people are always going to say stupid stuff. And some people are well-meaning. Some people aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, here this stuff is out there. But you know what? Your fitness is yours. No, your fitness does not belong to anybody else. Your running story or journey doesn't belong to anybody else. And so so you get out there. Get out there and enjoy your run. People look at you, they're going to look at you. You know, people are always looking. They're always, they always will have something to say. <laughs> uh, people will, will always be, um, some people are still stuck in whatever kind of mindset they're stuck in um, about whether it's weight loss or about the, the, you know, whether or not you should be out there running in your big body because, you know, maybe you're going to hurt your knees or your back. You don't know. You don't know me. I don't know you. You do your run. I do my run. And then we'll all be happy. Mm. So. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that that was kind of the, the intention behind uh, my blog. And, and also just wanted to share my stories of, hey, you know, I went out on a I did my first marathon <laughs> or I did my first ultra and here's how it went and here's how much it sucked, but here's how much, uh, how wonderful I felt afterwards, you know? So like I wanted to give a real, a real view of what it was to run long distance and my body, um, you know, also as a black woman too, that, that was also very important to me. And then it, it, it seems like it enlarged even beyond just uh, stereotypes around weight mm-hmm. to body positivity that you're, uh, and as I read it, you know, I'm 68. I've got my knees used to dislocate when I was a teenager. I've always basically considered myself a cripple in terms of running and even mm-hmm. getting upstairs now is miserable. But when I read your book, I thought, you know, this is my body. Yeah, I've had trouble with my knees and, mm-hmm. and this and that. I'm of a certain age. And there was just a sort of sense that in this body, I could have as high an aspiration as you've had for doing things that you love that are hard physically. Mm-hmm. And so did you end up sort of expanding the sense of who you might inspire to not just people that were too heavy to be considered normal runners? Yeah, sh- yeah, sure. And actually, um, I get hundreds and hundreds of comments um, on all of my social media from people um, who aren't necessarily runners. Hey, you know, I have always been interested in climbing, but I always thought I was too weak or I was, or I was too black or I was too short or I was too whatever it is. But I, I think I'm going to sign up for a climbing class mm. or, um, 
you know what? I have always been afraid to go outside and walk because I, I feel like I'm too heavy. But, you know, because I read your book or because the, of this article that you wrote or this blog post that you wrote um, or the video that you posted on Instagram, I think I'm going to do it because, you know what? I don't care anymore what anybody thinks. And I get, you know, I get so many of those messages and, and it makes me so happy that by, by me simply putting myself out there, people feel like they have permission to also put themselves out there. And, um, you know, like, and, and it's, it's kind of, you know, I haven't started a movement or anything, but it's really, really fascinating to see how people get inspired and motivated. Um, and that, that's awesome. And, I'm, and I love being part of that. Yeah, for sure. It looks like you've kept a journal most of your life. Did you start a journal when you were a young girl and now write every day? Well, I, you know, these days <laughs> I do not journal. <laughs> My journaling happens on Twitter Facebook, uh -huh. <laughs> and Instagram. I, as, as a, as a young girl, I did journal a lot of, I didn't journal every day, but, um, I did a lot of writing in my journal, especially because I, I was, I was very, uh, I, maybe not socially immature, but I wasn't very social mm. <laughs> and I didn't have a whole lot of friends. So I read and I wrote, I read and I wrote when I was in high school, but it was very different. Um, I did it because I, I did it in addition to having friends and having a social life and, and also being appreciated for who I was. And, but, uh, yeah. And then, and then after, I guess in college is when I really stopped writing in a journal. I, I kept a book journal <laughs> of all the things that I read. Uh, when I started, when I finished kind of like, you know, pre Goodreads, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and, um, but that was, that was it. That was, that was it. And then, and then, then after college, I, when I was working in corporate America, I actually started journaling again in the form of morning pages. Uh -huh. So, so I would do, I would get up super, super early in the morning, do my morning pages and do yoga. And then, uh, so that was kind of a, my rhythm for a couple of years. Um, uh, but then I stopped <laughs> after I had my son <laughs> yeah, <right>. less time <laughs> in the morning. He was my morning pages. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. If we could conclude, if you could read, actually it's the last few paragraphs of the book. I think that'd give okay. people a, a flavor for the writing and, uh, yeah, we're actually at the end of the book. This is the last two paragraphs and the poem that I uh, that I wrote after the last paragraph that it's actually for, was inspired by a Walt Whitman poem um, in terms of all of the the gerunds and the progressive <laughs> uh, tense. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I'll start. This body isn't meant to stagnate or cease moving. When we stop moving in mind, body, and spirit, we stop learning. When we stop learning, we stop living. Therefore, when we stop moving, we stop living. We stop evolving toward being the humans we are destined to be. This body is fierce, beautiful, and unapologetic. It's meant to move through the world as it wishes, lifting, walking, and running, rolls and all, Love handles, bouncy boobs, curves, tummy, butt, back fat, and all. I honor her by continuing to move along the spectrum of health and wellness. And in turn, she honors me by living vibrantly. Fat girl running, swimming, moving, learning, pausing, progressing, jiggling, rubbing, chafing, shaking, sinking, rising, living, being. I have been speaking with Myrna Valerio, author of A Beautiful Work in Progress. Thanks very much, Myrna. Thank you so much for having me on your show. In content, I want to mention a book by Clayton M. Christensen titled How Will You Measure Your Life? He's a Harvard uh, Business School professor who I heard at the reunion, and I've got an excerpt from his talk that was quite moving, and I'm going to save it till next week so that I can tell you about it, uh, but I will have a link to his book in the show notes. Also in content, I'll have a link to uh, an omnivoricious list of children's books timed for Halloween. 
I can't tell you yet who will be on next show as my guest, but I have someone booked who I am very sure will be of interest to you. I'm going to close with Taps, played by a Navy service member at my Uncle Bert Ty's graveside service this week. He was a veteran of World War II in the Navy. He was a captain of a landing craft infantry or LCI ship. Rest in peace. Rest in peace.